this amazing, great wild card weekend. All right. I love it when the wind blows so hard I have to stay inside on the couch and watch football all day long. It's rough, isn't it? That's okay. It's South Texas. It's cold like two days. We act like it's, you know, we can't make it. We're going to be all right. Good day for fishing, Brother Dan. So today oh, we're, we're in our series, Vision Map. Almost forgot what I was here for. Um, and uh, charting a new course uh, as we, we kind of launched out this new year. And, and so last week we talked a little bit about uh, direction. And today I want to talk to you about uh, destination. Okay? Talk to you about destination. Now, destination is something... See, we live in a world that, uh, for some reason, we used to have weddings in churches. We don't do that anymore. Nobody has a wedding in a church anymore. We always have it at a venue. Because why have it at a church for free when I can pay $10,000 and have it at a venue somewhere? And so, you know, obviously, my children too. I couldn't convince them otherwise. And so, um, and then, which was awesome and great. And sometimes I can tell you on Sunday morning, I'm grateful that we're doing it that way. And uh, also, uh, but, but a lot of people go on, a, some of you've had, or probably maybe you had a destination wedding, okay, where people will go off to a destination and, uh, and have a destination wedding at some exotic island, St. Joe's or somewhere like that. I don't know where you would, might do that at. And... Um, and so my, 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 I'm always worried about that because I'm always like, well, you know, you, you really started big. Now, I hope your relationship can live up to all this, right? Because I, I know how life can go, you know, in a relationship together. So anyway, so I just thought about that when I started thinking about destination, that God has this destination for us. Uh, and I would say if our destination is heaven, it's a beautiful, glorious place for us to have as a destination. Now, it's all about the journey, okay? By God's grace as a believer, you've started, all of us start, the Bible tells us, life down a road that doesn't lead to a good future. And so in Jesus, we're given the opportunity to switch over and to launch out on a new kind of journey with God at the center of of our lives. And we do that, that happens at uh, the place where I receive Christ or commit my life to Christ. I shift to a new road. And I start traveling a new type of journey. Now, for a believer, the duration of the journey is not always the same, but we're still called to walk and to have the expectations of conduct that are the same for all of God's people as we begin to follow the Lord. Okay? And our destination is eternal life with Christ in heaven. Your destination will ultimately influence your journey. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be the factor that changes how you walk, where you walk. Uh, your journey will really be affected by your destination. That makes the difference. So what I wanted to talk to you about today, I thought it would be good to talk about some of the keys to determining your destination in Christ. What are the keys that really determine, how am I going to walk in him? How am I going to live in him? What's going to be different about my life because now Jesus is at the very center of my life? How does it change? How do I live it? How do I walk it? How do I express it in my life? How can I give God back just a little bit of the amazing thing that he's done inside of me as Jesus goes to the cross and dies for my sin and gives me the freedom to live life without sin? Isn't that cool? And so how do we begin to live that process? What are the keys to determine that, okay? Well, the keys are this. Number one, first of all, is that you have to know your destination. If you don't know your destination, your chances of getting there are really slim, Okay? You have to know your destination. Now, direction, not intention, determines your destination. Direction, not intention, will determine that. Okay? 
The scripture says in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many people enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Oof. So you need to know your destination because it's important that you're moving down that road and that road is not always easy to find the destination to eternal life with Christ. There's a lot of options out there that will lead you down a road that's not as powerful or as effective or as amazing for your life. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ... Set your heart on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You see that? I mean, now that you've been raised in Christ, okay, you have a different destination. You need to start setting your mind towards your destination. Okay? Set your minds on the things above, not the earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's helping us find out where's our direction, where's our destination, how do I keep my eyes on it? I have to keep my eyes above. So it's direction, not intention, that really does matter. The Bible teaches this. It says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Whoa. Good intentions pave the road to the wrong direction. Okay? So it's not the intentions that matter. It's the direction that we take. Intentions are not commitments. Intentions are not focus. Intentions are not directions. They're just intentions. They're not even real. They don't take us anywhere. Intentions just can lead us, lead us down some bad roads. We've got to begin to move where God wants us to move. Now, churches are famous for saying some cheesy things, okay? Have you ever noticed that before about churches? Church, we can come up with some really cheesy slogans with churches, you know? And just kind of sometimes I hear what church is saying, I just kind of roll my eyes just a little bit, okay? I remember, uh, you know, one church, they had, uh, they, they created these little buttons that were round and the words uh, to it were written on it, okay? And they said, that day they got up, they gave it to all the congregation and they said, we just wanted to give you a little round to it because you keep using the excuse, I'll do it whenever I get a round to it. So now you have a round to it. You could go ahead and get started for God, right? Cheesy? Yeah, you tell me. Yeah, that's pretty rough, right? You know, <laughs> churches are known for doing that. But it's the direction, not the intention that's going to matter. So if our de destination is heaven, then the scripture says that our minds have to begin to be set towards heavenly things. We've got to think about those things and meditate on those things and move towards those things and let those things be kind of the number one focus in our lives, okay? If our destination is, on, is to, you know, things above, that's heavenly, our destination, then we need to start setting our minds up there, okay? Uh, if you... You have to know your destination if you're going to focus on your destination. If you're going to move towards your destination, you've got to stay focused on it, okay? Now, my father, whenever I begin uh, to drive, uh, oh, by the way, thank you guys for telling me happy birthday yesterday. I appreciate that, okay? Thank you for all of your, your well wishes for my birthday. I really appreciate that. But my dad... Uh, as a young man, my my grandfather owned a cattle trucking company here in South Texas, and so my dad was always a cattle truck driver. And so, in my family, by the time you were 14, you were supposed to be hauling something. Okay, you know they thought you should be driving a truck hauling something when you were old enough to you know talk. And so, uh, my father would always tell me when I would when I was beginning to drive, and he was teaching me how to drive. He would always say, "Now, Les, you." In order for you to drive a straight line, you have to focus ahead of you, out in front of you. You pick something out and you focus on it and you drive towards that. that that's the way that you begin to drive a straight line. If you wait and focus to something up close, it's going to be too late and you'll be swerving back and forth. You've got to see it out front a little bit, okay? So but that's one thing my dad always taught me about driving. 
Now, he taught me two things. The other thing he always told me was, if someone's coming at you with their lights on bright, be sure you look at the white line on the right of the road and let that, you know, guide you so you don't get blinded by the light. So he taught me that too, okay? Two things that you have to know. Uh, and, you know, uh, I've, I've taught my children to drive. It's been my opportunity to teach them to drive. My daughter had three wrecks, accidents. My son had one. And, and uh, well, I guess they each have, I don't know. I haven't done very good at that. Okay, I maybe should have focused on that just a little bit. But it's important to, to, to keep driving and keep our focus to the place that we're driving so we can be sure that we're moving towards our destination. And so our, if our destination is heavenly bound, then we need to stay focused heavenly bound. And the reality is in this life that that road is a little bit narrow, okay? Don't you hate it when you drive to Houston on 59, where there's been construction for 55 years, right? They've been working on this, okay? And you get down in that area where the construction is, and all of a sudden the lane comes down on you, and there's, you know, concrete on the left and cars on the right, and you're just stuck in this little bitty lane. You really have to focus, or you could make a mistake there. So narrow is the way. And so driving through bad weather or driving through construction can really begin to wear down on you. And you have to even stay more focused during those times. So as a believer, when I run into times that are hard where I might be struggling, I've got to tighten my focus just a little bit because narrow is the way. And I've got to get through that narrow way. So if our destination is heaven, then I've got to have my mind and my direction set to move heavenly for the Lord. And the reality is that Jesus actually is our destination. Jesus actually is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He provides the way to our destination. He was the first to achieve our destination. He leads us to the destination. Jesus is the destination that we follow after. Why else would he say, come to me, or would he say, live in me, or follow me, or if you know me, you know the Father. Jesus is the destination into the journey, through the journey, and after the journey, our destination is in Christ. If we know that, we're well on the way. My destination is in Jesus, through Jesus, by Jesus, to Jesus. That's where we belong. And once we begin to understand exactly what our destination is, then we know the direction that we begin to take. It's not our intention. It's our direction that really is going to matter. And so, first of all, you just have to know your direction. Okay? The second thing is this, number two. Number two, you must embrace your direction. You must embrace your direction to and through Jesus, okay? Now, remember this, your situation is not your destination. Your situation is not your destination. Many times we find ourselves in a situation where we say, Pastor, I'm not sure that this is the place I really want to be. And I, and I will agree with that. It probably is not. But remember, that situation is not your destination. The Lord is going to see you through that. You're just going to have to trust him. You've got to embrace your destination. It's not the situation I'm moving to. It's my destination that I'm moving to. And a good destination for the Lord will get you through whatever situation you might face. The Bible says it this way in Philippians chapter 1. It says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Isn't that a great verse in Philippians that really encourages us? Titus 2.12 says this, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Oh, I thought that was written for, you know, 2,000 years ago. No, no, no. It's written for today. God still expects his people to live upright, self-controlled, to be the citizens that God has called us to do. We live as heavenly citizens. It's great. Now, here's the destination situation that we're facing right here, okay? 
in Philippi, Paul, Paul's uh, given us this verse that we just read here in Philippians. He's talking to those guys that live in, in Philippi. Now, now, Philippi is actually in the province of Macedonia, okay? But at the same time, it's still underneath the rule of the Roman Empire. Okay, and he's reminding them, now, even though you're in Macedonia and you're kind of out here on the edge, you're still under the rule of the Roman Empire. And so out here on the edge, you need to, I, I know that even though you're out here, way out in Macedonia, still you have to live under the rules of the Roman Empire, right? You still live by those rules. Oh, yeah, we do. And he's saying, well, in the same way, spiritually, even though you're here on earth and you're living in this world and you not, have not yet reached your heavenly place, I expect you to live under the rules of heaven because you're citizens of heaven now. You're no longer citizens of this world. Isn't that cool? So he's challenging us. So I want you to live by different rules. You now have given your life to Christ. So now you live by God's rules, Okay. Well, pastor, what exactly are those rules? Oh, no, no, no. You got a Bible. You can read that yourself, okay? I don't have to give all of that to you, right? There's some rules you like me to make the decision, all right? You want the judge for that, right? No, no. I'm not one to blame for your mess, okay? I'll let you discover some of that yourself. How's that? Yeah, that's a chicken way out. I get it, <clears throat> okay? But that's for us to discover. So part of us listening and believing and trusting and then reading it. God's word is for us to learn how we can better live as citizens of heaven the way that the Lord wants us to, okay? Um, for a believer, that means even though I'm not in heaven yet, I want to live as though I'm living there right now. It's almost as if heaven has come for us right now, and we want to live the way that God wants us to do right here. Now, I had a grandmother uh, that lived in Houston, Texas, okay? Now, my poor mother grew up in Houston, Texas. Uh, my mother rode the bus to Macy's and worked her job and rode the bus back home. My mother was a city girl who accidentally married a guy from Port Lavaca, Texas, okay? Her life changed at that point, all right? She, my mom told me, she goes, your dad, I couldn't believe it. She goes, we drove up to a bay, and he took a seat out of the back of his car and put it out on the beach, and we fished out of the seat of his car. He goes, these were the biggest hillbillies I'd ever seen in my whole life. I'd never seen people like this before, all right? You know, a whole new world. Now, her mother had some really strict rules when you went to her house, okay? In Meemaw's house, we called her Meemaw, okay? Sometimes we called, my sister called her Mean Ma one time. I would never have done that, but my sister did that, okay? I knew better. And so, I, I, I'll never forget one time we were going to, to you know, to Mean house. And Mean had rules, like when you sat on the divan, we had a couch, she had a divan. When you sat on the divan, you didn't put your head on the back of the divan, because the oil from your hair could, you know, mess up the divan, Right? I mean, Mima had plastic cover on her carpet that she had in her house for 30 years with never a spot on it ever. I was 19 years old before I was ever allowed to go in her living room, okay, by myself, you know. It was a place as a child, if your toy rolled in there, you left it. You didn't go get it. It's just like, I lost it, you know. It rolled into the living room, okay. And so we would like practice uh, a week before we would go to her house. My mom would change the rules on us. Okay, we got to start practicing because y'all got to know this when we get there, all right? You know, and we would kind of warm up to it. She just had her own set of rules, okay? Her rules were heavenly rules, I guess. I don't know, you know? Actually, they were a little bit too legalistic, right? But even as citizens, of heaven in the same way we're already when you come to Jesus your your future is is heaven you're you're there you're moving that direction but we already today begin to live with the joy and fulfillment that you have in heaven with each other because we begin to live by some heavenly rules okay so if you know Christ you don't live in your past anymore you live where you live in your future there's no more living in the past. The past is behind us. The sin, you know, we've been forgiven for our sin. Our sin is put away. And now we begin to live in the freedom of the future, of serving God, of being what God has called us to be, okay? And honestly, as believers, we should have a natural desire to do that anyway. We should have a natural desire to put away that 
old life. As, as Christians, we now we're representation. We represent our hometown. We represent heaven. And we're citizens of that. So now we represent it. It's our gospel home. It's our heavenly home. It's our heavenly city. It's heaven. Okay? Um, I remember we had a friend of ours, Tisa, um, uh, Coach, actually Coach Pat Erskine. Some of you might know Coach Erskine. And, and uh, our kids were good friends growing up. And so he would always tell our kids, he would say, now, kids, when you guys go out in the community tonight, remember your name represents our name, so pay attention how you live. Wow, that's a good word, right? I think that's what God tells us. You're believers now. You're followers of me, so you're citizens of heaven. So pay attention how you conduct yourselves. And so we conduct ourselves as citizens who seek the credit and safety and peace and prosperity of the city that we represent okay now we're we're heavenly statesmen for god now we put our chest out and hold the lapel on our jackets and we're we're statesmen right for heaven we're children of the king now we got to pay attention to what we're doing and how we live because we never want to give a bad reflection to that Christ that we represent. We man up. We pay attention to what we're doing, to what we're saying and how we're saying it. And we're a positive influence for Jesus from now on. We're, as the Bible says, ambassadors for Christ. Wow. You're an accredited diplomat for Jesus. Ooh, that's some high talk, right? Oh my gosh. A great statesman for Jesus. Don't be afraid to say some flowering words for Christ and maybe hug a baby every once in a while. It's a good idea, all right? You know, I mean, we're politicians now for Jesus. Oh, let's don't use that word. Let's just stay with diplomat, okay? Never seen a politician that I would trust, right? Um, George Allen, here's a name you guys may remember. Today's football. My mind's stuck on football today. I apologize for that. Um, George Allen was a guy that pastored the Washington football team with no name uh, now, which to me that's appropriate. I'm cool with that. And uh, years and years ago he, he coached, and George Allen was known to take some guys that were later on in their career, their careers maybe wrapping up, maybe almost over, and he took those guys and he would put them together and he would create these great football teams. You know, guys that had like a second chance, man. They wanted to go at it one more time. And he had a, 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 he had a motto that he would use and it was this. He said, the future is now. Didn't build on draft choices. He built on people that were out there right now. The future is now. And that's us as believers. Our future is now. Our future is not tomorrow. Future's not when we get to heaven. Our future starts today. And so we live in the middle of our destination right now, the way that God wants us to live. So when we look at this idea of destination, uh, we think, number one, you have to know your destination. And then number two, you have to embrace your destination. You've got to start living that out. It's got to be a part of you. It's got to be what you're all about. It's got to be how you live your lives. Here's the last one, number one. Number three. There's only three today, isn't that cool? All right. Number three, you must fulfill your destination. Embrace it, fulfill it. Okay? Here's something that we need to know, number one. Uh, not number one, just something we need to know. There might be 15 of these, so here's one, okay? So I don't want to put numbers on them, right? All right. You never drift your way to a good destination. You never drift into a good destination. You have to discipline and prioritize yourself into it. You don't just accidentally move in the right direction. You've got to make a choice. And you've got to prioritize your life. You've got to discipline. It's called discipleship. You've got to decide, I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to live that way. 
And I'm going to put some effort into it. I'm going to work at it. I want to become what God wants me to become. Fulfilling our destination. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 to 3 says this. The Lord said to me, write down the vision. We're doing our series called Vision Map. Write down the vision. Write it clearly on clay tablets so whoever reads it can run to tell others. I like that. Whoever reads it can run to tell others. The vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, then wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Isn't that awesome? Good stuff. Habakkuk. So we want to fulfill our destination. We must continue to drive ourselves towards our kingdom destination in the Lord. If not, we'll drift off of it. So you've got to drive yourself. Hey, we're close enough to the beach. You guys know when you go to the beach, and I can remember as a, as a young man, Every time I get a birthday, I get older. I mean, you know, but I remember as a young man, okay, that I would go to the beach and we would surf on, on, I remember going to surf Padre Island, which is almost impossible, but we would try it, okay? And I can remember going out in the water and if you would be in the water uh, and for very long, you would look up and you would have floated way down the beach and you wouldn't even know it. You'd be way down here. Then my place I started would be way back, so we had to walk all the way back to get our stuff, you know, that we left back there. And it was amazing how you would just kind of slip off and drift down the beach. You see, if you don't keep focused and if you don't keep determined, if you don't keep moving where God wants you to move, you're going to drift, you'll naturally drift way away from where God wants you to be. And you'll get off your destination. So you have to have a vision of that destination that God is calling you to. And you just don't automatically drift in the right direction. If you drift, it'll be in the wrong direction. So you got to take some intentionality. That's the word. Some discipline. Some discipleship. The Bible says it this way. It says, take the time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Last week, I, I mentioned to you guys that I felt God laid it on my heart that I needed to lose some weight this year okay I did, thank you guys for all of your emails on how I should do that I didn't know you guys really took that much interest in that but boy I got more emails this week from people saying oh pastor here's the way you could lose some weight I appreciate that I really didn't know you were paying attention but okay you were paying attention and thank you guys so I will take that well it's okay but the scripture says to take the time and the trouble to keep ourselves spiritually fit now all of y'all had the same theme in what you told me you told me that I was going to have to intentionally eat less and intentionally exercise more you are brilliant thank you guys for that encouraged me okay and I may need some more of that but we all know this it doesn't happen accidentally if I just eat and live the way that's easy I can promise you my weight won't change at all. It'll take some intentionality. It'll take some direction. Our, our, our goal with the vision is to know exactly where God wants us to go and start going that way together as his people. That's vision. And the Lord said in Habakkuk that our goal with vision is to make it plain. To make it simple, to make it clear, write it down, clearly it said on tablets. Engrave it, put it in stone, put it where the public can plainly see it, where now there's no longer an excuse. This is my direction, this is where I'm going. Make it simple and clear so that people can see it and discern it and take it and deliver it to other people. Make it easy to say. Make it a slogan. 
make it an easy statement. Read all about it. Here it is. It's easy to understand. The group can come together and they can read it and they can go out and they can make it clear to others. Read all about it. And then it says to make it visual. Make it visual where you don't forget it. Where it's written down. Keep it in the public's eye so it doesn't get easily forgotten. It was so crazy in the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, how many times when God's people wandered off the path and went into times of spiritual darkness that literally the Word of God would disappear. They couldn't even find it. And then someone else would be elected the new king and the new king would come and take over and he would say, things are changing. We're going God's way. My father was a loser. We're moving this way now. And he would say, where's the... Torah that we used to be so committed to that held the word of God and the kingdom would say we don't know it's gone and he would go back and get the Torah the word of God and he would gather it up and he would say repost this we used to have it stuck up somewhere now it's been taken down it doesn't it's not in the town center anymore it's not up on the walls of the church where is it Let's put the word back up. And they would make God's word the new center of their lives. And all of a sudden, a revival would come and change would come and God would begin to work in the middle of his people. Isn't that cool? We just got to keep it fresh. We got to keep God's word where we could see it, keep it in front of us. Well, how do you keep God's word out in front of you? Well, you sing God's word together. You preach God's word from the stage. You read God's word. You life group God's word together. You share God's word with other people. You fellowship around God's word. God's word just becomes a priority. Oh, it's what the Lord wants us to do. You focus on it. I'm intentional. I'm going to live the way God wants me to. Together we gather around that vision and it's plain and it's simple and it's visual and we begin to take it and share it and let it become a part of who we are. I'm fulfilling the destination. I'm a citizen of heaven. I don't have to wait and live like it when I get there. I can do it now. Isn't that cool? So I know my destination and I embrace my destination because it's who I am and now man I'm going to do all I can I'm going to intentionally fulfill that in my life and I'm going to live the way that God wants me to live that's the vision map the Lord has for his people we just have to learn how to follow it we have to learn to get it out and unfold it and look at it thank the Lord now we have a GPS Everybody knows that once you unfold a map, you can never put it back together, right? You just throw it away. I mean, it's just no good. But God gives us that map that he wants us to follow and to give everything to as we chart a new course. Well, what direction is God calling you to go? And how intentional are you going to be about moving that way? That's the question. Let's bow our heads together for a time of prayer. And as we close, I just want us to reflect a little bit. What is the new destination or what is the destination this year that God is calling you to? And how is he calling you to move towards it? How can you make it a part of your life and start living it out with intentionality right now? What's God calling you to do? Is he calling you to enter into a relationship with him for maybe the first time? Is he calling you to recommit to that walk that you've had with him for years? Is he calling you just to step it up and maybe for the first time really begin living like a citizen of heaven and to start representing him in a brand new way? I don't know. That's between you and God. But however God is asking you to step to the plate... Ask him to help you do that right now. Just make it your prayer. I'll give you just a couple of seconds for you to make it your prayer. God, I want to start moving in a new direction. I want to start representing you today because I want to see the life change that really comes when I get committed to you. So I'm dedicating and I'm committing myself to you right now. Make that your prayer. I'll just give you a few minutes to do that.
All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the scripture. Thank you for our fellowship. Thank you for our time today, God. And we thank you for a destination that you've given to those that are willing to receive you and to follow after you. And God, help us today to really truly in our heart know what your destination is. Help us to really embrace that. Make it a part of who we are. God, and help us to fulfill that. Help us, God, to finish the journey big. Finish the way you would have us finish, God. Help us to just follow hard after you. And God, we thank you that we know our future is safe. It's in your hands and it's glorious. Thank you, God. Thank you for the eternal life you give us through Jesus. We celebrate that together and help us to live as citizens of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.